Good afternoon and welcome to the Washington Legal Foundation. I'm Glenn Lammy, Chief Counsel of the Foundation's Legal Studies Division. For those of you not familiar with the Foundation, we are a 36-year-old public interest law and policy center, which gets involved in a wide range of issues uh, at the uh, Supreme Court, the U.S. federal courts, the federal agencies, state agencies, pretty much anything that has an impact on free enterprise and the creation of laws and regulations that affect free enterprise, we have a pretty significant presence in those areas. Um, for those of you who are going to be watching this on the website, please uh, spend some time after the fact and, and uh, check out our, our site and some of the information that's there um, and some of the programs that we have coming up as well. The Center for Responsive Politics recently found that the Environmental Protection Agency is the second most lobbied administrative body in the federal government next to the Department of Health and Human Services. The use of the term lobby with relation to EPA may strike some as odd, given that most of us, when we think of lobbying, we think of Congress or state legislatures. Effective advocacy at EPA, however, simply beyond filing comments with the agency, is essential if you are a regulated entity, but it is critical to understand how it is different than legislative lobbying and what works and what doesn't work. For over three decades, today's speaker has been honing the fine art of administrative advocacy for and against certain outcomes. He's been involved in everything from so-called sub-regulatory battles to major notice and comment rulemakings, as well as the judicial review, which very often results from EPA action. He will share some of that knowledge with you today, and uh, we'll be uh, starting in a moment. I wanted to introduce him first. Richard Stahl he is a partner in the Washington, D.C. and Milwaukee offices of the law firm Foley & Lardner, where he concentrates his practice on federal administrative and environmental, environmental law matters. Mr. Stahl has been practicing environmental and administrative law since the 1970s, when he joined the EPA Office of General Counsel. Upon leaving the EPA, Mr. Stahl for three years was Deputy General Counsel of the Chemical Manufacturers Association, which is now known as the American Chemistry Council. He is also the author of Effective EPA Advocacy, Advancing and Protecting Your Clients' Interests in the Decision-Making Process, published by Matthew Bender this year. He will be utilizing a PowerPoint presentation slides along with his presentation, which you can view in the box adjacent to yours as well. Uh, if you uh, have any questions for Mr. Stahl during the program or afterwards, please email them to interactive at WLF.org. And I'm going to step aside and give the floor to Dick Stahl. Thank you, Glenn. I want to uh, thank the Foundation very much. You guys have been doing great work for a long time, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you, whether it's live or an hour or two later or whenever people can watch if we're not going live right now. Um, and I'd like to start with slide, if we get on slide four, I'm going to talk a little bit around that for a little bit. Um, but what I am going to do, and as we go through the slides and I go through the presentation, and hopefully we'll have time for questions, uh, I'm going to sort of follow an outline that Glenn asked me to follow from a couple of chapters of the book that I wrote. It's, he mentioned effective advocacy for EPA. Uh, one of the chapters deals with going well beyond your written comments when, you're, when there's a rulemaking, uh, and uh, how the point is, is that written comments are important, and, and in fact, they're probably the most important thing as part of your advocacy, but they're sure as heck not the only thing. And if that's the only thing, you're not doing enough. And then beyond that, Glenn had asked me to talk about a couple of chapters I had in the book about sub-regulatory guidance. Because as the lobbying that Glenn mentioned goes on not only for rulemaking in EPA, uh, there's awful lot of guidance that's not really rulemaking that people seek sometimes on individual basis, case by case basis, and sometimes more on national basis where it's still guidance and not rulemaking. Uh, just a few basics to make sure we're on the same page, to sort of set the stage before I start going through the outline in the book, um, is re remember now, and I, I presume anybody who's interested enough to watch this probably knows this, but EPA's regulations cover a wide swath of economic activity in this country, and they affect almost all economic interests whatsoever in many ways, in, in many dramatic ways. And they also protect health and the environment in many dramatic ways. And because the regulations that are issued are so pervasive and do so much with respect to controlling industry and companies and individual behavior and farming and agriculture and so forth, and because there's so much of this directly relates to how, is, how clean is the air, how clean is the water, there's a heck of a lot of advocacy, advocacy going on on all sides of this. And there's industry advocating, there's environmental groups advocating, there's states and local governments advocating. Sometimes not everybody's aligned the way you might think they're aligned, but there's a lot of that going on all the time. 
And I think what I want to talk about today is just the, the, the different ways people might do that at an EPA rulemaking stage uh, and also how to get maybe certain guidance that's not rulemaking. Uh, realize also now that the rulemaking process, and even though it's called informal rulemaking, it's called informal, that's the technically correct term, formal rulemaking means something else, and, and we're not going to talk about that today. It's informal rulemaking, but it is extremely time-consuming and it's extremely cumbersome, and it's gotten that way much more over the years. Uh, when I was at EPA in the early 70s, we, we went through some rulemakings that had dramatic effects, like national ambient air quality standards. Everybody who knows the Clean Air Act knows you, you can't have a much more significant rule than that. We put through some national ambient air quality standards in just a few months from the time the proposal hit the Federal Register to the time the final hit the register. Anybody who follows EPA today knows that that never happens anymore, that it, it's become a long and long and long and cumbersome process. It's, it's basically because over the years, the judicial review, the reviewing courts have increasingly demanded more and more of EPA by way of explanation on everything that they do, and, and the record gets longer and longer, and the comments get longer and longer, uh, and, the, and the whole advocacy process gets more. And there's more steps along the way that have been added. We, when I was there, we didn't even have OMB review or OIRA review, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. But now we do, and it's in a big way. Executive Order 12866 and the ones that have followed have added layers of complexity and layers of steps and hurdles. Also, there's been more statutes that have been acted for more regulatory analysis and paperwork reduction analysis, all sorts of additional analysis. So this, all the steps along the way are getting heavier duty for EPA to follow uh, along the process. Um, and despite all that additional hurdles and, and burdens that I'm talking about, despite all those, uh, I, I have to stress it's still a very open process, it's, and it's very informal. And it's not anything like a judicial proceeding. It's not anything like an administrative law judge proceeding. In other words, you can contact EPA virtually any time you want to in any way you want to. You can call them. You can email them. You know, things you would never think about doing with a court <laughs> uh, is calling up somebody and talking about the issues or sending them an email or having meetings and stuff like that. It's all very loose, it's all very informal, and people need to know the ways they can get in and out uh, and to sort of maximize the possibility that they can get what they want uh, out of a rulemaking or perhaps guidance. And I just wanted to just to make this all kind of topical, to make this all kind of topical, uh, I've got today's Inside EPA. Now, if you're watching this today, we're talking June 16th. So Inside EPA is a good trade um, press, or it, it, it's a good publication. People get it online now. Also, I got to mention BNA or, or the Bloomberg BNA Environment Reporter. It's a great publication. People who follow EPA closely probably read Inside EPA every day. They probably read Bloomberg BNA uh, every day. So, but just here's this morning's Inside EPA, and it's going to lead into what I'm talking about. Here's a story. The first story is how. The administrator of EPA is out meeting with some utility executives at one of their meetings about a new rule that hasn't even hit the Federal Register yet. I should say a new proposed rule that hasn't even hit the Federal Register. Register. It's a multi-billion dollar rule having to do with greenhouse gas emissions from existing power plants. And she's at a meeting talking to these people and she's already conceding that maybe certain parts of the proposal didn't focus on nuclear and uh, the nuclear plants as much as they should. And she's even saying in the story, that they may even have a second round of proposal before they go final, which is news to me, but that's, and, you know, and I know the Obama administration's in a rush to get this rule out, but she's already saying in this story that, so, here, so here's, and, and, and by the way, you'll see from the slide, I say, vote early and vote often. Uh, well, they're voting early here, and, and that's, that's very important, it's very critical. Uh, here's another story uh, out of today's uh, Inside EPA, let me get down to it. Uh, oh yeah, here's a good one. Uh, here's the headline, fearing recycling curbs, waste firms urge OMB to relax EPA's DSW, which stands for Definition of Solid Waste Plan. So here we've got uh, a bunch of waste industry people, and there, by the way, there's a rule now that EPA is trying to go final with, and it's sitting over at the Office of Management and Budget, OMB. And I think for simplicity during this conversation, I'll, I'll just keep referring this to OMB, for the Cognoscenti, there is something under OMB called the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, OIRA, but that's part of OMB. It's easier to say OMB. So, but here's somebody, again, voting often. <laughs> it's not early, but it's often. 
because even though we've gone through a proposal and a final here, EPA has a final, but they sent it over to OMB for review. And OMB, as I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, can make dramatic changes in a rule. They can even throw it back and reject it. And we have waste firms going to OMB to exercise their advocacy rights uh, on this rule. So there they're, they're voting often because they've obviously been through the process of, of rulemaking and all that kind of stuff. Uh, here's a couple of interesting ones as we're going to segue into sub-regulatory a little bit later. Uh, here's two stories in today's Inside EPA that I'm going to get to later, but it's, they have to do with sub-regulatory. D.C. Circuit finds that Sierra Club lacks standing to challenge a memo that EPA had issued having to do with the so-called cross-state rule. For, that's, that's for uh, power plants having to do with the so-called good neighbor provision. There was a big Supreme Court case about this a few months ago. EPA had to decide how to implement certain regulations after the Supreme Court ruled a certain way, and they did it by way of a memo. They did it by way of a guidance memo, not a regulation. The Sierra Club didn't like what the memo said. We're going to talk about this in a minute. There's a theory out there that sometimes EPA calls something a memo or they call it guidance. Sometimes courts will say, oh, that's really a regulation and you should have gone through rulemaking and we're going to reject it. Sierra Club tried that there and they lost. Okay, but here's another case on sub-regulatory guidance. EPA to release guide for post-closure care of hazardous waste facilities. So now there's regulations under the Resource Conservation and, Recre uh, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, which is called RICRA. There have been regulations out there for years on post-closure and so forth. But now EPA is going beyond the regulations, sort of filling in more details, and they're going to issue guidance for that. Uh, and, and they're going to have public comment on the guidance. So it's a little bit like rulemaking, but it's not really rulemaking. Uh, so now if we can, so again, sticking with slide four just a minute, I've already made the point that informal rulemaking really is informal. Um, and I said vote early, vote often. And vote early, now if we, if we can go to slide five, uh, just so you know, uh, I mean, this whole thing about voting early and voting often is, is not something I dreamed up or people started dreaming up, stuff like that. If you go to the federal registers, you go to executive orders and all that kind of stuff, I mean, that's officially encouraged. I mean, I quote from an executive order which Bill Clinton issued a long time ago, uh, then on slide five, then we go to slide six. There's an Obama, um, there's an Obama executive order. Uh, then you go to slide seven, and here's Elisa Jackson, who's the last administrator of EPA before Gina McCarthy. And they, what they all say basically is, when we're going to go through a rulemaking, federal government, this applies, by the way, to all federal agencies, not EPA. You know, whenever you can, particularly for significant rules, bef even before you start the rulemaking process, try to get public involved, get, get interested people involved, and so forth, and, and get everybody in early. And again, when I do say vote early, vote often, and I think the way Glenn titled this, uh, this whole program is, is, is something about don't rest on your written comments. Don't re and you, you can't rest on your written comments. If you wait for a proposal to hit the Federal Register and that's your first time you've even gotten involved in a proposed rule, that's way too late. That's just way too late because too many decisions, too many decisions are going to be made uh, by EPA by the time they issue a proposed rule. And generally by the time a proposed rule, most options that could have been put in but aren't put in are rejected and EPA's framework is pretty well set. And you can get changes after a proposed rule, and you often do, but your, your scope of changes after a rule proposed are generally much less than uh, what you would get uh, if you can help shape the proposal itself. If we can go to slide eight now, uh, I had a section in my book, and this, by the way, this applies a lot to your written comments as well as your advocacy going beyond written comments, but I thought I'd go ahead and state a few general principles, and also some of these general principles apply to uh, even, even to uh, seeking guidance and so forth. Uh, now, recognizing where EPA's authority begins and ends, Obviously, if you're a lawyer, you know that, and, and that's important. You know, I don't need to tell you that. But a lot of times you have to tell your clients that. You, you've got clients out there, and they're very upset when they hear EPA is starting to do something, and EPA is going to propose a certain set of standards or so, so forth, and they say, well, I just can't do that. That's ridiculous. Or, or then they might, the, the client tells you, well, well, get it changed to, an, instead of EPA requiring 100x, get them to change it to 30x. Well. The statute might preclude EPA from going below 50x, or the statute may, re or somebody might say to you, 
uh, they shouldn't be regulating this type of industry at all. It doesn't make any sense. Well, maybe there is a provision in the statute that says the EPA must regulate that particular type of source or entity. So, again, it's just important to know where the authority ends and, where, and, and so forth. And also, if you're before EPA people and you're, all, you're always trying to be smart and, and you want their respect, and that's important, you, you always want credibility when you're meeting with the EPA people. If you start arguing in front of EPA people something that they don't even have authority to do or that goes beyond the authority they have, I mean, you're going to lose a lot of credibility really fast. So you don't want to do that. Uh, the second one I have on slide eight, and this is critical, facts, data, specificity. What EPA people hate, and you can't blame them, is they issue a proposed rule and you go in there with your clients and they say, gosh, this hurts, it's going to kill us, this, this, this makes no sense, this is going to, it's going to drive us out of business and so forth. And then EPA people say, well, can you explain why? And, then, and you don't have any data, you don't have any numbers, you, you can't show them profit. You, you, you've got to be able to have something to show with, and they, they really need data. And particularly remember, and I'm going to get to this in a minute, you're always going to have judicial review, almost always going to have judicial review, and that EPA, anything they do on a rule, they know is probably going to get judicially reviewed. And so therefore, any decisions they make one way or the other has to be backed up in some rational way so it's not arbitrary and capricious. And the more data they have to demonstrate that what they do makes sense, the better off they are. So that's, that's why I always say the more that you can give them by way of real facts and data and, and not just sort of generic oh gosh, this hurts, this is awful, this is un-American, uh, you know, that might, you, your clients might like to say that, but it just it isn't going to carry the day there. Um, number three is also extremely important. Uh, always think defensively and always assume you're going to have enemies in any rulemaking. So let's say, let's say I represent the Natural Resources Defense Council uh, and I want a certain rule a certain way and that's great, and I want to shape it and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to assume that the National Association of Manufacturers is going to be doing something exactly opposite of what I want. Or let's say I represent industry, which I often do, or usually do, or I guess always do. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but I, I know when I'm in there, I, I know that um, uh, NRDC, the Sierra Club, people like that, sometimes states, and sometimes even other parts of industry. Sometimes within the same industry because alignments aren't always, you know, exact. I mean, different companies in different industries might align differently. So I'm going to assume that there's, even though I like what EPA is doing, uh, I'm going to assume there's going to be people who don't, and they're going to be submitting all sorts of data and comments going against the grain of my client. So I want to do, do anything I can to add to EPA's record, to support EPA, to give them more data to support what they want to do if I like what they're doing. Because eventually, again, assume this is all going to get judicially reviewed. Uh, number four, you don't need a total victory to do good for your client. I mean, uh, again, clients don't like to hear this sometimes, but maybe they hear that EPA is going to issue a proposed rule and it's going to affect their industry, and the way they think it might be shaped is just going to drive them crazy. It's going to cost them lots and lots of money. They don't think it's worth spending. Well, sometimes there's ways to shape proposals. And sometimes, you know, what your client wants is you want, they want you to go to EPA and say, don't, you know, don't do this rule. Well, <laughs> maybe that, that might work once in a blue moon. But, you know, sometimes instead of maybe EPA doing what they were originally thinking about doing, maybe instead of regulating every source in industry, maybe you can cut it off somewhere. Maybe you can say maybe it has to be more than 200 tons a year or something. Or maybe you can say if there's subcategories within industry, maybe they can cut off certain types of subcategories. Or maybe, you know, with all sorts of, and, and also details, details are very important. Sometimes maybe EPA was thinking of regulating a certain type of industry a certain way, and what they didn't know with the engineering way, the way it worked, it wouldn't even work at certain types of plants. And if you could go with data on that and, and actually show EPA that the certain type of engineering doesn't work at a certain type of plant, maybe they would make adjustments and, and maybe your client, again, they, w they still won't like the fact that they're regulated, but maybe the ultimate final rule will be a lot better than what might have been proposed. Uh, if we can go to slide nine, you might think I'm being facetious here when I say be nice, but it is important. <laughs> uh, and, and I've been guilty many times, uh, and by the way, this applies both verbally and in writing. Um, I've been guilty many times of, of getting wrapped up and all wound up and, and preparing written comments and I really get, feel juiced up and I don't like what EPA is doing and I get really sarcastic in my draft and I, you know, I say some really funny things and sarcastic things and so forth. Boy, 
I, hopefully I'm good enough about always going back the next day or the third day and, and editing and taking the sarcasm out. Clients like that sometimes, by the way, and you should see what some of my clients draft and send to me, but it, it's not effective. Uh, the, you know, the, the written word doesn't move on, and, and so you, all of a sudden the EPA people who are reading this nasty, sarcastic stuff that they take as an affront to them, it, it can have very negative impacts. Impacts, And I'd say the same thing when you're meeting with the EPA people. I mean, be honest, be firm, let them know you're upset with something they're going to do. But, you know, they're honorable people, they're civil servants, and, and, uh, you, and, and by the way, you're going to have to work with them for years. <laughs> so there's no point in burning bridges. I mean, you, uh, you know, be firm, let them know you're upset, but, but, you know, don't get mean, don't get nasty. That will be remembered. Um, people often ask me this, and, and uh, for number six, you know, what if you're dealing with people at the staff level, and I'm going to start talking in a few minutes about who you deal with and how to get to them and so forth. If you're dealing with people at the staff level and you're not getting what you think you like, you know, and they're, they're, you said, okay, to go up to their boss, well, sure it is. And they, people do that all the time. But let them know. I mean, let, let, you know, get the other person involved, you know, send an email perhaps to the department head, or not, not the department head, the division manager, the division head, say, I'd like to have a meeting and copy the other person on, in fact, even call the other person. And this happens all the time. So again, if you're, if you're judicious about it, careful about it, I don't see any problem with doing that, and, and it's, it's a good idea. Um, here's another one that may be too obvious to spend too much time on, but, but again, maybe you haven't dealt with the federal government too much. Or maybe if you're a lobbyist and you're a true congressional lobbyist, maybe, you, maybe this is something that you hadn't thought of. But when you're dealing with EPA people, it's, it's not like company to company business dealings, and it's not like lob lobbying with Congress, and that is you don't call up somebody at EPA who's working on your rule and ask them to go have golf with you at the country club. You just don't do that. You don't call up an EPA person and say, hey, come over, we're going to have cocktails, you know, or whatever. That, that does not work when you're dealing in rulemaking with the federal employees and so forth. It may, it may work with Congress. And again, company to company, sure, uh, that happens all the time. I have one possible exception to the vote early principle. Uh, there is, you know, the general rule is, is that the more open and back and forth you have before EPA ever proposes something, probably it's all going to be better for you. I've heard people say, and I can see this might work every once in a while, is that if you knew that EPA was leaving out some important factor as they were leading towards a proposed rule, maybe it's better to keep your mouth shut and go ahead and let them propose it that way and then try to blow them out of the water at the written comment stage. Um, I, can, I couldn't think of too many examples of this, but something happened recently with a very significant rule under the Clean Air Act where EPA is proposing new source performance standards based on carbon capture. And there is a provision in something called the Energy Policy Act, which is not one of EPA's statutes. And I guess a lot of people at EPA don't bother to read statutes that aren't their own. But this Energy Policy Act of 2005 actually said that EPA could not base a standard for new source performance standards for power plants on any technology that was being funded for demonstration purposes by the Energy Department. Um, yet EPA's proposed rule is basing, uh, is basing carbon capture in, uh, in large part on, on plants that are being funded for demonstration purposes by the energy, energy department. EPA didn't seem to recognize that at the time of the proposed rule. So now they're, they're doing a lot of backtracking. There's been a, a lot of delays on that. It's been kind of embarrassing. That may be one example where you, you have a certain argument that you just sort of wait on and, and not put out before EPA, before the, the proposed rule. Again, I think that's the exception rather than the rule. If we can go to slide 10, uh, I have a, an item here which I call the, you know, the, your opportunities might depend a heck of a lot on the nature of your interest in the rule. That's, I guess that's, that's pretty obvious. I mean, and, and this also, I'm going to segue in pretty soon to how you get to, work, to meet with people in the EPA and who, who to meet with and can you really get meetings and how often and so forth. And again, that has to do with, you know, how significantly impacted might you be by a rule. Uh, and then also to segue into how to get meetings and how do you know what's going on and how to, how to know when a rule's coming along. I have a little section in my book called the Cognoscenti. I mentioned that word once before. I mean, there are a bunch of people here in Washington and around the country who, you know, their life revolves around EPA. I mean, they, they follow EPA rulemakings constantly.
uh, they're in trade associations, they're in law firms, they're in consulting firms, they're in the Washington Legal Foundation, they're in a lot, a lot of different places. So uh, those people, and, and, and by the way, it gets subdivided. It's, ama it's amazing how we subdivide. Uh, and, may and maybe somebody's an expert on the Clean Air Act, but they don't do anything in the Clean Water Act. Or, and I know one firm in town, I'm being slightly facetious and they're a fine firm, but I think in one office somebody's an expert on Section 165C of the Clean Air Act, and the next person is an expert on Section 165D of the Clean Air Act. Anyway, you probably know, if you're a cognoscenti, you know who I'm talking about, but they're an excellent firm. But so we, we, we do have specialized cognoscenti and we have more general cognoscenti. The point is there's a bunch of people who, if the question is, well, how do I even know that there's a rulemaking brewing? Well, the cognoscenti probably already know, okay? Uh, because they, they, they go to meetings all the time. They're, they're reading Inside EPA every day, like I mentioned. They're reading Bloomberg BNA. They're reading the WLF alerts. They're, they're on the web. They're, di they're just following it all the time, and they just know. Um, if I could go to slide 10, uh, 11 now. Um, so, so, but I, so what I sort of say is, well, what if you're not in the cognoscenti, and, and hopefully a lot of people who are, are watching this are not, you know, can you find out if EPA is working on a rule that might be of interest to you? Uh, and again, one thing I'd recommend is if you have any suspicions whatsoever, I mean, I, I do recommend that anybody who has any interest in this wants to sort of read the daily trade press on what's going on uh, with Inside EPA. And actually, they, I think Inside EPA and Bloomberg BNA both have weekly publications too. So maybe reading weekly is enough. Uh, but, and, and uh, you know, you can go on the web and start doing stuff like that. But one thing you can do, and this is right on slide 11, uh, is there is there's a regulatory agenda that's required now by these executive orders that every agency publish, and uh, you can go to the regulatory agenda and there's a long list of, of rules that EPA has under development. And again, because this rulemaking process is a long one, I mentioned that earlier, all the steps and hurdles, even before proposal, they'll usually have on that list stuff that's in the works that probably won't be proposed in the Federal Register for, for maybe a couple of years. So you can go on that regulatory agenda and see what's interesting. There's also, if we can go to slide 12, there's a regulatory development tracker that, that goes for more significant rules. Um, and there's a, EPA's now, EPA has a lot of stuff on its website now and it changes all the time. And I've done two editions of my book and I've sort of given up on trying to put websites in there because it's, it changes so much. The basic thing is if you just do a little searching and a little surfing, you can probably find what you need. Um, but you go, uh, so anyway, there's alerts and there's block, you can get yourself on alerts for certain type of things. If you want to be alerted to any new Clean Air Act thing, you can get on a serve list for that. And there's blogs for this and that. If we can go to slide 13. So, okay, here we go now. So we're, now we're talking about, and this is where it gets a little more interesting. Uh, now you know that there's a rule that's evolving. Um, and now you know that it's important that you get in early. Okay, well, how do you do that? Um, and, and there's, a, there's a number of ways, but, but what people often do, and a lot of times, again, this is trade associations and people here in Washington, but that doesn't mean that this, is, this kind of activity is limited. If you represent a company or if you represent an environmental group somewhere in Chicago or Milwaukee or San Francisco or whatever, and you know that you're interested in a rule, this is all stuff that you can do. Um, first of all, you need to find the right people in EPA, and you need, and you need to contact them and meet them. Well, now, how do you go about doing that? If you go back to that regulatory agenda, oh, by the way, the cognoscenti probably already know who the right people are, okay? But, it, but you can go back to the regulatory agenda and with every proposed rule on there, there will be the name of one or two EPA staffers who, and their phone numbers are there and their email addresses are there. Uh, and by the way, I ought to mention this right now. EPA has, on their website, they have an EPA locator. And of all the federal agencies I can think of right now, it, it's superior. In fact, it, it, it makes the Department of Justice website pale by, I mean, it, because, in fact, on the Department of Justice, I don't even think you can find people's names. But, but anyway, an EPA has a great locator, and once you have a person's name, you can search, and, and all of a sudden you get their phone number, you get their email address, you get, you, you know, you get a mailing address if you want to use real mail. Uh, and so once, anyway, once you have a name at EPA, it, it's easy to find those people. Um, if, if, if you're not sure, there's, there are other ways to do it. I mean, again, you can go on EPA's website and you can find out, well, who's the assistant administrator for AIR? Okay, well, at least you can email that person or call that person's office. Now, you're not going to get a hold of them, but 
if you tell their assistant that you're interested in a rule about widgets, then that assistant will eventually get a message to the person at, who's working on widgets, and they will contact you. Or you, you know, you, and by the way, you do have to be persistent sometime when you're doing stuff like this. Don't expect sometimes that you're going to get your first call answered. Don't expect that you're going to, you're going to get your first email answered. But there are ways to get to the right people. And then meeting the right people is something I mentioned. What you want to do, what people often do early on as EPA is developing a rule, is if we can maybe go to slide 14, um, is you'll, you'll want to go ahead and have meetings, if you can possibly get them in, and so, or just phone calls. Go ahead and introduce yourself uh, and, and your client's interest to the right person at EPA. Uh, maybe you can start sending them data by email, tell them what your interest in the rule is. You can ask for a meeting. And don't expect that they're going to want to meet with you frequently. But if, again, and this has to do with how critically interested are you in a rule or your, or your group. But the more interested you are in, the more that a rule may impact you, the more you have to offer by way of data and, and significant you know, real arguments and significant data, significant interest. Or if you're, if you're a citizen's group and you're talking about significant interest in emissions that are near your home or something like that, the more you can let these people know that you have a significant uh, impact and, and could be adversely affected in a real way by something they're doing, the more likely it is they're going to meet with you. Uh, and, and if they can't meet with you, they're certainly going to engage with you by email and maybe by phone now and then and so forth. But, but frequently you can have meetings. And, and it's important, again, to get your credibility established right away with the EPA people and, and go in there, whether it's by email or phone or, or a meeting, let them know that you're you know, honest and earnest, that you have real data to give them, real arguments to give them, let them know exactly how you're affected and so forth. And, and, and they'll, be, you know, they'll be impressed with that, hopefully. And, you can lay the, and what you're doing is you're laying the groundwork. You're laying the groundwork for more follow-up. Maybe you'll only have one meeting before a proposed rule is issued, but at least they'll remember who you are. You can submit more data and so forth. And that way, they'll also remember who you are when you submit your written comments. Now, one thing we're not talking about directly today, there, there's another chapter in my book that's all about submitting written comments. Again, that is, by the way, legally the most significant thing you can do in a rulemaking, legally. But again, we're, we're, I think everybody understands that. But right now we're talking about what you can do before written comments and after written comments. So after written comments. So you, now you're laying the groundwork. If they remember you, they remember that you have credibility uh, and stuff, and they remember you're nice and all that kind of stuff. It's going to inure to your benefit uh, as the rulemaking processes uh, go forward. Um, I, I mentioned in slide 14, I think we're on 14 now, uh, that, and, and people do this all the time, is coordinate your efforts. I mean, a lot of times a certain type of rule might affect, um, well, let's, let's say all of an industry. Then you usually have a trade association that will probably represent the industry. Uh, but as I note in point two, um, the coordination can't go too far because sometimes even within a certain industry, you're going to have uh, companies that don't necessarily uh, have the same interest. Uh, that is, is really showing itself in a real big way right now in some of these power plant proposals like, like again, the cross-state rule that the Supreme Court recently ruled on. Uh, there we had, in, both in the rulemaking and in the courts, we had power companies on one side of the issue and power companies on the other side of the issue, depending on, it had a lot to do with how much they depend on coal. Uh, and we're seeing the same thing on some of these greenhouse gas proposals right now. And I've seen the same thing in other industries where depending upon the nature of the fuel source, the nature of the process, the nature of the technology that a certain industry might use, you can have a lot of disagreement with industry groups. So you can only go so far in relying on a trade association uh, to do what's um, needed to be done. Uh, if we can go to slide 15, um, and I've already made this point, uh, number three. And, and so what you often find is, and, and I have an example recently with one company in a trade association where it, the company watched the trade association's comments and participated actively, but the, only the trade association filed comments. But it's a good thing the company participated actively in those comments because the company wanted to make sure that a certain type of technology was singled out in the comments because they, they were very adamant and able to show through data that the proposed rule didn't work for that particular type of plant. Okay, well the rule went final 
and it turned out that most of the people in the trade association turned out they just didn't that they were happy with the rule. But one company who was active in helping prepare the comments was not happy with the rule. So they have now gone to the DC circuit and they're the only company in that trade association that's done so, but they are able to rely on the trade association's comments to get them, you know, to get their arguments before the court and so forth. So again, it's it's important to watch what kind of comments are being developed, even when you're in a trade association, and even if the trade association is going to file comments on its own, uh, you know, make, make sure you watch what they are, and if you're not going to file your own comments, and by the way, companies do that sometimes, like a trade association will file a set of comments, and then, then different companies will file their own Me Too's, or maybe their own special little comments on special kinds of issues. You can do it that way, but again, in the example I'm thinking of now, just because the company relied on the trade association to make the right points within the trade association comments, they were protected. Uh, piling on, <laughs> what, what we're seeing now, and I think there's an IS, IRS proposal recently that I think there were hundreds of thousands of comments. It was, it was, it was, but mostly they're me too. In other words, so somebody puts a website out and says, hey, here's five paragraphs, send it in. So you know, and, and now we could file comments on the web. So is that helpful? Um, maybe a little bit. I mean. It, Sometimes it, it, there's, it, maybe it'll impress people to see the numbers, but it, to the, most of the EPA staff, when they can see is exactly the same thing 100,000 times, it, it doesn't add a whole lot of weight. Uh, I'm sort of neutral on that. Uh, here's another important point, J, targeting advocacy on various issues to EPA components. Okay, on EPA rules, there's usually issues involving economics. There's usually issues involving technology. There's usually issues involving you know, pure legal questions, sometimes policy questions, sometimes health effects, sometimes toxicity. EPA has a lot of different types of offices that do a lot of different types of things. All those different offices might be involved in any particular rulemaking. So just as when you do your written comments, which we're not talking about that much today, you would have your written comments directed to these different issues and, and, and you know, and, and maybe have different consultants write different part of your comments. And when you do submit, submit your written comments, you make sure that the right people in the right compartments get, the, get the, those comments. Also for meetings, when you're doing your advocacy, your emails, your telephone calls, your meetings, remember, and, and sometimes you might just want a meeting with the EPA economic people on certain issues. Or, and so just be, be cognizant of that. I, as I mentioned in the book, some of the nastiest meetings I've ever been to in my life are internal EPA meetings. And as EPA is developing a rule, these, sometimes these components can get very, very, you know, adverse to each other. And sometimes if you can play that, it might be to your advantage. Um, if we go to slide 16, I've already mentioned this. And again, I'm just going to keep refer referring to OMB. Uh, every significant EPA rule at the proposed stage and the final stage goes to OMB for review. OMB represents the president. The EPA administrator works for the president. Therefore, and some people don't like this, and some people talk about challenging the constitutionality of this, but it hasn't happened yet, OMB has a lot of power. Uh, and OMB has often rejected EPA's rules. OMB has thrown them back at EPA for more work. Sometimes OMB reshapes EPA's rules. I say usually not. Usually, or maybe if, if there's any changes, they're little nits, but often enough, uh, there was an ozone proposal that, that uh, Lisa Jackson wanted to do a, a year or two ago, and the Obama administration through OMB wouldn't let her. Uh, there's a fly ash rule that Lisa Jackson wanted to go with a hazardous waste designation a couple of years ago, and the OMB process wouldn't let her do that. They forced a proposal that would be either hazardous or non-hazardous, you know, sort of a neutral proposal. So they do have great power. How do you know a rulemaking package is lodged there? There's a website you can go on, and OMB is very transparent about what rules they're reviewing. Uh, I will say again, because OMB is not EPA, and they don't have engineers, and they don't have a lot, you know, they don't have a lot of staff, they're looking for more big picture issues. Uh, but, but sometimes the big picture issues, just like in those two examples I just gave you, where they really threw back stuff that EPA wanted to do, and they said no. Uh, Procedurally, OMB is different. Dealing with OMB is a lot different than what I'm telling you about when you can go to EPA and you can have meetings and you can have phone calls and all that kind of, OMB is kind of tight about that. Uh, they will take written submissions, but with a meeting, and they will meet, but their meetings are very sort of strictly organized. You have to go in and, and there's, there's 45 minutes and they basically just listen to you and they won't engage with you and all that kind of stuff. 
Whereas usually when you meet with EPA people, they engage with you totally. They may not agree with you or they may not tell you what they're going to do, but they will engage with you. The OM people hardly ever engage with you, but at least they listen. Um, I'm going to mention just very briefly because I want to get on to sub-regulatory. Um, in slide 18, sometimes you can elevate your rulemaking issues. You can get congressional interest, and, and this, these have to usually be with really big rules, like some of these power plant rules. So you see congressmen having hearings about why is EPA doing this, why is EPA doing that. Congressmen send letters to EPA all the time. So maybe if Congress is going to have a hearing, you can make sure that you get the right questions you want answered to, you know, for the record. So EPA, you know, you can try to embarrass EPA or you can try to help develop the record if you like what they're doing. Uh, but again, be careful on that. Uh, and I think we're about ready for sub-regulatory. Okay. Um, now one thing, I just want to make sure I haven't missed any points here that I really wanted to cover before we go to sub-regulatory. Um, okay, I think. Now, even though you won't believe how many words EPA has issued in regulations over the last 40 years or whatever, um, and there's hundreds of thousands, there's questions that still, you know, they don't answer every question. They don't deal with every, or sometimes they're confusing, sometimes they're contradictory. Um, so we have, a lot of process going on where, for various reasons, EPA can't answer every question in a regulation, and maybe they don't want to. So there's a sort of a world of sub-regulatory decision-making and, and, and sub-regulatory issuance of, of memoranda, opinions, and guidance documents. And, and if we can go to uh, slide 20, and, and maybe I've already covered these points, I mean, there's sort of this constant need for clarification and elaboration of what the regulations say, either because of inconsistent, you know, and, and the phrases that are, that are confusing. If we go to slide 21, then EPA does issue this sub-regulatory guidance, and there's various formats I'm going to get to in a minute if we can go to slide uh, 22, because I'm going to cover this first stuff kind of early, uh, kind of fast. The um, one thing, by the way, if EPA, I'll, I'll get to this now. I've categorized guidance into sort of like part or type A guidance and type B guidance. I'll say type A guidance is when you sort of need something decided on a fact-specific, site-specific basis, and you're, you're maybe you're the only one or you're a few people are the only ones interested in a particular issue. And often then you'll have letters or opinion letters or so forth like that. But there's also sort of type B guidance, which is sort of the more national guidance. And I mentioned that earlier on. I said, I said EPA is going to have guidance on this, uh, uh, what was it, yeah, post-closure under the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. They're going to issue a guidance document, even through notice and comment, through some kind of public comment process. That's a type B guidance. Or for a while, EPA was issuing guidance on what's waters of the United States. They were issuing that through guidance. Now they've decided to go through a rulemaking on that that's highly controversial. But for a while, that was this so-called type B guidance. Now, it's, um, I want to get to point G real quick here. This sub-regulatory guidance, and, and here's one of the big differences between a regulation and guidance. If it's a regulation, it's law. I hope everybody understands that. Like if the Clean Air Act says, for instance, if you violate a, a certain section of the Clean Air Act, you can be held for both civil and criminal penalties. But the Clean Air Act always also says if you violate a term of a regulation, EPA issues under the Clean Air Act, you can be held for civil and criminal liability. Okay, guidance, on the other hand, is not binding. Uh, it's, it's, it's EPA's interpretation, its view, but it's, again, it's sub-regulatory. There's nothing in the Clean Air Act that says that you can be held to be in violation of something EPA said in a guidance document. But it is important. And that is because there's a body of law that's out there in the cases and so forth that says that you, the, the courts do give deference to EPA's guidance. Now, there's, it's very mixed case law. It's some of the most confusing case law you can ever get into. And there's things like Skidmore and Chevron and all these cases, Mead. And they all say different things, and they're not consistent. Okay, And, and every year, the Supreme Court says it a slightly different way. But the point, what they keep saying is, is that it's entitled to some deference. So. The point is, if, if, if a regulation leaves a question open, but then EPA says that in guidance it means this, and then all of a sudden you're in court, like an enforcement action, and you say it doesn't mean that, 
Well, a court is going to at least respect and probably defer that guidance. So you'd be better off if the guidance didn't say that. <laughs> and you'd be better off trying to get, you're better off if you can get the guidance to say what you like. Okay. Now, how do you find, so it's important if, if you're seeking guidance and you're looking to see what's out there and you're, and you're trying to figure out whether what you're going to do is legal or not, you get clients call you, clients call you and say, can we do something? Is it okay if we do X? And you read the regulation and the regulation is not clear. Well, before you give them their answer, what you usually do is see, is there guidance on that issue? How do you find it? That's evolved over the years. Uh, it used to be very hard to find it, and it used to be only the cognoscenti knew where it was, if they knew, or only people who actually had received guidance knew. And you could call Region 6 of EPA and ask them about something, and maybe Region 4 had issued something two years later, and people in Region 6 wouldn't even know it. And that still happens a little bit. But it's getting much more regular, regularized, thank goodness, for the web. So now you can go on, and, and, and uh, in fact, there's a website, I think it's called EPA Significant Regulatory Guidance. And there's other websites, and you have to fish around. And again, in the two versions of my book so far, I've sort of given up on giving people websites because it changes so often. But the point is, um, the point is go find it on the web, and also start making calls, making calls to EPA. Also, sometimes uh, Inside EPA and Bloomberg BNA have good uh, search tools, and in and, and their search tools, you can start finding stuff like that. So there's, there are ways to do it. Uh, and if we can go to slide, I think I'm going to go to slide 24 now, uh, moving ahead. I've already mentioned type A and type B guidance. Uh, and I have some general considerations for getting the guidance. Now, if, if it's type A guidance, again, this is where you might specifically be affected by a certain rule and you want to know more about, you know, what does it really say, and, and you might want to get an answer that you like. In other words, you would like the answer to be X, and you hope the answer is not Y. So you might want to get a letter out of the EPA or a memo out of the EPA that says X. Um, how, do, how might you do that? Okay, so here's some more of these general considerations in slide 24 that we've already talked about. The same for when you're doing rulemaking advocacy. You know, in, in slide 25, be nice, you know, all these general considerations. Uh, because you, there's a, you can have meetings with EPA on guidance, you have phone calls, you can have uh, emails, and, and again, what you, what you want to do is tell them, for instance, that the rule could go either way. You want to present them with facts and data, if you can, and, and good policy arguments, why you think the rule really means this or really should mean that, and why, and what the adverse impacts would be if it meant why, and so forth. And so, you can go through this same process of meeting with the people, and, and actually this is a little more informal than even the rulemaking stuff, uh, because it's, sometimes it's just you, there, you don't have enemies on, enemies on the other side because there's no notice of proposed rulemaking even in the works, and you're just doing this. On the other hand, you have to be nice to these people and press gently because, because they don't have to do this. You know, if you're asking them for guidance, you're asking them to do something they don't really have to do, and they may not have a lot of time, and they've got a lot of things to do, so again, You've got to be careful with how you do this, but be gentle. And usually EPA people will be responsible about this. If there really is an open question and they recognize that you could be adversely hurt and adversely affected by this open question, they'll usually be responsible and try to give you an answer. Okay, but let's, if we're in slide 26 now, um, and this is, I think this is really important, and it sort of ties into this whole issue I mentioned earlier about how courts will defer to EPA's guidance. Look at C1 on slide 26. Decide whether you want the guidance, okay? And what I'm going to try to explain here for several reasons is you may not want it. When you, if you start scoping things out and you start meeting with EPA people and you, maybe you start looking at other things they've said in the past, you might start to get the feeling that you're not going to get the answer you want. Well, you can always just sort of say, oh, guess what? We don't, forget it. <laughs> We're happy, we won't bother you anymore. We know you're busy. Because, and I'm getting to the punchline, I guess, maybe the worst thing you could get, if you're seeking guidance that's, that you want the answer to be X, and they send a letter back saying the answer is Y, then if you're in court, you've got a letter out there that says it's Y. If you had never gotten that letter, it would still be open. It, it'd be an open issue. So if you're in court in that situation and EPA hasn't said anything either way, I'd rather have it that way before a court than have EPA's letter 
saying why. Now, again, you can argue to the court, well, that's, that's not binding. It's not binding, you don't, and it doesn't make sense. But once EPA said why, uh, you know, you're, a little, you're behind the eight ball a little bit. So it, that, that's some of the points I'm making here. You, 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 you try to scope things out. You learn what EPA has already said. You start making preliminary contacts. And, but again, it, it's very important to uh, evaluate the pros and cons of moving forward. But let's say you decide you do want to move forward. Let's go to slide 27. Uh, again, you, you try to meet with the right EPA people, people if you can, or maybe a phone call is all that's necessary, but let them know what's going on. You can do a lot of this by email. I say send an excellent letter. You mean, send a letter in, and it should be like rulemaking comments. It should be very responsible. It should be you know, very authoritative. Cite, cite other guidance that they've issued if, it's, if it goes in your favor. Let them know that you've done your homework, by the way. Don't ever go in there and sort of make it sound like, well, you really haven't done any research on this and you haven't read their preambles and you don't, but you just wonder what the answer is. They don't, you know, that, that's, they're, they're not gonna do well with you on that. Let them know that you've done your homework, Let them, show them that you've done your research and show them that, you know, even with your research that you still need this answer because it's something open and they'll respect you a lot more and, you know, you'll have a lot more credibility with them. Point four, I do mention uh, push gently because, um, Again, um, you have the, uh, uh, the, the, the problem that they don't really have to do this for you if, if they don't want to. Um, I do want to get to two or three things that are very current as, as before we leave the guidance and may have a little time for a couple of questions. Uh, some th something happened today. Again, if, if you're, I hope you're watching this today. This is June 16th. Um, because there's an intersection of guidance and rulemaking that's very interesting. Okay, now let's say, again, and let me set it up this way. I think I mentioned earlier that when EPA issues guidance, sometimes it might look like a rule. And sometimes courts have said it's a rule. I, I mentioned that one, one case earlier on. Uh, there, there's been a body of case law in the D.C. Circuit where EPA will issue something by way of a memorandum, a letter. Uh, one time a press release got held to be a rule, believe it or not, in a, in a pesticide issue. But more, more typically, it's something that looks like a guidance document. And sometimes a guidance document really is guidance, and a court looked at it and said, yeah, this really is guidance, it's not a rule. But there's all sorts of tests. Is it, well, does it appear to be binding? Does it have real-world effect? Uh, there's lots of different tests. We don't need to get into them now. But what you need to know is every time issue, EPA issues something that's called guidance, you might want to consider whether maybe that's, they went beyond this and they should have issued a rule. And by the way, as you might imagine, EPA sometimes doesn't want to go through the rulemaking process because it can take forever uh, and go through OMB and then automatically be subject to judicial review, whereas if they can issue a guidance document as long as they can claim that it is guidance, they don't have to go through OMB and they can survive, they can stay out of judicial review. Now, here's the thing. So let's say EPA or any agency had issued something a few years ago that clearly was interpretative. It wasn't a rule. And let's say that was okay. Let's say that any court that even thought about it would have said, yeah, that did not have to be a rule. It just did not have to be. Okay, but then what if the agency changes it? What if the agency reverses that interpretation and it's a long-standing interpretation and people have relied on it. There's a body of case law in the D.C. Circuit and the two cases most frequently cited are Paralyzed American Veterans and Alaska Professional Hunters. I don't have the sites right here. And there's a new one that came out last year called Perez versus Mortgage Bankers Association. Okay. And there the D.C. Circuit has this body of doctrine or this rule that, well, if, if it, even if you start with something that's okay as non regulatory as an interpretation, if people have relied on that for a number of years, then, e then the agency can't change it without rulemaking. Okay, so that's what those cases stand for. Now, the federal government has always hated those cases, and EPA has always hated those cases and the federal government, because this is sort of an agency-wide thing. This isn't just EPA. Well, and most administrative law professors think those cases are wrong. Well, on Mortgage Bankers Association, the Supreme Court granted certiorari today. So the government went after that, the government went after this doctrine in a big way in a certiorari petition a few months ago. A whole bunch of administrative law professors filed amicus briefs supporting the government. Administrative law professors have always thought those cases are wrong. So an interesting case on this intersection of rulemaking versus guidance. If the government wins that case, 
then this doctrine in the D.C. Circuit that EPA can only go, or other agencies can only go through rulemaking to change longstanding interpretations, that's going to go out the window. Uh, there's two other cases quite recently that are kind of interesting that have to do with guidance. I've already mentioned this Sierra Club case uh, that, that just came down on June 13th. There, the Sierra Club tried to get an EPA memo that was interpreting what they should be doing after the Supreme Court ruled what they ruled on the cross-state rule. EPA tried to fix things up instead of a regulation through a memo. The Sierra Club argued that they couldn't have done that through a memo, it had to be through rulemaking, but the, the, the uh, D.C. Circuit threw them out on, grand, on grounds of standing. <laughs> so we still don't know whether the D.C. Circuit would approve of what EPA did there, but the Sierra Club lost that on grounds of standing. So I guess for now the memo stands. But another interesting case, May 30th of 2014 in the D.C. Circuit, it's called NEDACAP, that's N as in Nancy, N-E-D as in dog, A cap, NEDACAP versus EPA. A real interesting case where EPA had lost a, a case on how they interpreted a certain rule uh, in the Sixth Circuit, and so they issued a memorandum, and the memorandum said, hey, we'll follow that case in the Sixth Circuit, but in every other circuit, we're not going to follow it. We're going to enforce the law the, the way we've always wanted to enforce it. And NEDACAP took EPA to the D.C. Circuit on that, and the D.C. Circuit first held that that should have gone through rulemaking. It, it was a rule in disguise. They didn't go through notice and comment. And the D.C. Circuit held that that memo was contrary to EPA's regulations. So I guess, and EPA's regulations, by the way, and most people didn't even realize they were there, there's some re regulations that have been in EPA's Clean Air Act regulations for about the last 30 years that basically just say that we're going to implement the act consistently through the country. But that, that's about all they say. And everybody sort of thought that was sort of a throwaway. Well, what the court said was that here's a regulation that says you're going to be consistent throughout the country, but here's a memo that says we're not going to be. And they're saying that memo attempted to amend that regulation, and it didn't go through rulemaking, therefore you can't do it. Now, so anyway, and by the way, the court did not there pronounce on whether EPA's interpretation that got thrown out in the Sixth Circuit was wrong or not, but they just said EPA can't have this inconsistent policy issued through a memorandum. I see we're almost out of time. Glenn, are there any questions? Sure. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate the uh, yeah. presentation. I want to ask you, you've been talking about how open EPA can be mm -hmm. in, in the rulemaking process. Have you seen the degree of this openness vary depending upon which party holds the White House at that particular time? Okay. For this thing about which party in the White House. First of all, substantively, that can make one heck of a difference. It didn't used to, by the way. When, when I was at EPA for a while, it didn't seem like it made much difference whether you had Democrats or Republicans, you know. But all of a sudden, and, and oh, then there was a little blip with Reagan and so forth. But then after, after the Reagan thing got over with, for a while there, it didn't seem to make much difference. But in the last few administrations, what we've seen is rules go back and forth, depending on who's in the White House. A rule gets proposed a certain way, but then there's an election, and then all of a sudden there's a pullback. So dramatically different substantive results. As far as the process, nah, I don't think there's much difference. I've, I've never seen, it's always been open. I think everything I've said today it would, would cover no matter who's in the White House or who the EPA administrator. It's always been open, and, and I, I think it'll always be that way. So just to follow that up, um, yeah. I would imagine that some rules, that an incoming administration would like to change them, but changing a rule is very difficult. So obviously then it comes down to enforcement priorities prosecutorial discretion. Yep. In, in the process of advocating at EPA, is there a way to effectively shape how they decide to enforce a rule or not enforce a rule? Well, I've never heard of anybody going in and trying to argue with EPA about how they should set enforcement priorities, except maybe environmental groups. Now, environmental groups, sure, sure because they say, hey, petroleum refineries, we want to, but, but, I, I, but, but on the other hand, I think your question actually does go to type A guidance because usually it's a question of, does, because you're worried about enforcement, you're worried about whether you're about to do something and is that legal or not. And so what you're trying to get through guidance is you want the answer to be X, not Y, and that's very enforcement related right there. Yeah. Do you see any trends for the future uh, developing an EPA's rulemaking process that affected parties ought to be aware of? 
Yeah, here's one, and it's, and it's kind of unfortunate in a way. And I mean, even, even though I represent industry, you know, always, I guess, and, and I guess some people in the industry like to, like to hear the idea that EPA is losing funds and losing resources constantly. That's really not good. That's not good for industry uh, because what's happening is, 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 and this is Congress's fault, I think, is EPA continues to have so many statutory obligations on so many statutory deadlines that aren't going away and there's more coming. And unfortunately, again, this is Congress's fault, the environmental groups have the right to go into court and get deadlines established for those, you know, for those rulemakings. So EPA is getting more and more harried and hurried and, and they don't do as good a job. And, it, and, it, 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 and, and they can't. I mean, it's not, it's not the personnel's fault. It's just that they've got too doggone many things to do. So I, I see more rushing. I see more rushing of rulemaking. I see more, you know, I hate to say it, but sloppiness, and it's not intentional sloppiness, but they just don't, I mean, there was a rule that came out a couple of years ago under a court order deadline, and it was such a mess that EPA had to recognize the day they issued it that they had to reconsider it. And they soon stayed it, but then that same court later on told them they couldn't stay it. I mean, it, and this has to, I've written about this several times, the fact that you've got these statutory deadlines enforceable by citizen suits, I think is a bad idea now, particularly when EPA keeps losing resources. And I would imagine that the reduction in resources would probably lead towards more guidance documents rather than notice and comment rulemaking. Yes, it, well, except, except for the fact that <laughs> you would think so, but I don't know, because the problem is at least the statutory deadlines, I mean, they, they get under court order, and so those go to the top of anybody's priority list. They go to the top of everybody's inbox. That actually might make it more difficult for them to is issue at least type A guidance because, again, their plates are so full, the, the personnel's plates are so full that they, when they might two years ago have had time to hear you out, they're on a court order deadline to get something out. And, and we've seen that a few times now where these court order deadlines are just driving them crazy. So, again, I, I'd love to see the law amended that way, but it's not going to happen unless we finally get alignment in the House, Senate, and the White House. <laughs> this, was, this relates somewhat to the court order deadline issue. The, one of the things that we've been seeing um, an increase in situations where EPA is sued by an environmental uh, citizens group yep. and then the court decision sort of leads to a situation yep. that has been labeled sue and settle where companies and states even that are affected by what happens in the process of settling a case like this don't really have an opportunity to weigh in. Right. What do you usually suggest to clients when, you, when, when they see a situation like that or, or it would, if, if you had that situation in front yeah. of you? Well, unfortunately, it's when you find out about it, it's often too late. Uh, and also, unfor and, and again, frankly, my basic answer to your question there is, I, and I've written about this, I think we're in a sad situation there where Congress has set the statutory deadlines, they've given the citizen suits the right to sue and get the deadlines, oh, and they give them their attorney's fees too, by the way, so we pay for those citizen suits right out of the Treasury. And yeah, in the House now, everybody's talking about sue and settle and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, the, the problem is with these statutes, the way they're written. Now, again, I know there's lots of proposals out there where people, where interveners should have more rights to come into these cases. But a lot of times, you just don't get enough notice to even know what to do. Hopefully, all that usually results in is a deadline and not something substantive. And, th and that's been the trend. I ask one more question. You yeah. talked about um, how effective sometimes can have to be agencies other than the EPA weigh in at a, an entity like OMB yes. slash OIRA. Is, is there a, a paradigm to having agencies weigh in with EPA where there might be concerns that what's going on at EPA might be either treading upon another agency's jurisdiction? And if there is, how can you as a, as a lawyer for a business facilitate something like that? I think in the normal course of business, for, for most rules, EPA does not want to hear from other agencies at, in the early stages. But the bigger the rule is, and, and, and since EPA knows that there will ultimately be OMB review, then I think the bigger the rule is, and particularly on some of these power plant rules, I mean, certainly the Energy Department and FERC and people like that have been involved at, at all stages. They just sort of have to be involved. So, and, and there are ways to get those, you know, those, those other federal agencies involved. But again, I, I, just, I mentioned earlier the fly ash rule. And, and how OMB sent that back to Lisa Jackson and said rewrite it a certain way. That was clearly, even though industry was in that in a big way and industry wanted that result, maybe industry helped, but that really came from the other federal agencies. 
the, the Department of Energy, Department of Transportation, even agriculture were weighing in on that in a big way. The record shows that. So it was the other federal agencies there at the OMB level that got EPA stopped from doing what they wanted to do. Well, we're going to put it to a close there. It's just about five minutes after. Dick, I want to thank you for joining us sure. today. Um, for those of you interested in uh, what's going on in the Supreme Court, in addition to the case that Dick had mentioned, the Foundation is going to be holding its annual Supreme Court uh, review briefing on the 20. Fifth this coming um, Wednesday, and one of our speakers uh, is going to be Jeff Rosen from Kirkland and Ellis, who's going to be addressing some of the environmental oriented decisions. So please uh, tune into that if you're able to do so. Thank you. All right.